He gave a rousing speech in the Democratic Convention testifying that the fact that Barack Obama was doing a good job and he deserved a second chance. He said, I want to nominate a man. These were his words of testimony. Who ran for president to change the course of an already weak economy. And just six weeks before his election, saw it suffer the highest collapse since the Depression. I want to nominate a man who's cool on the outside, but burns for America on the inside. And as the crowd started cheering lustily, he said, and by the way, after last night, I want, a, I, want, I want a man who had the good sense to marry Michelle Obama. Okay, I was telling Barack Obama chose two witnesses. One was a public witness, Bill Clinton, the other was a private witness, his own wife. And she gave a speech in the, in the convention, testifying the fact that her husband was actually a, a good man who deserved a second chance to be president of the United States. He said, she said, she, no, I've been living with him for several years, and he says, and 23 years, and this man has never changed. And she talked about how she would, you know, work late at night and he would read these emails from that jobless young man, from that old man who didn't have medical insurance and says, and say to her, we have, a, we have work to do. He'll, we have work to do, Michelle. We have work to do. These guys, we've got to keep working to fix this. We've got so much to do. And then, today, is what the election. And he's going to be U.S. President for four more years. Now turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 11. And I'm going to talk about a chapter, a Bible chapter, which talks about two witnesses. Two witnesses. Now, uh, I'm going to interpret this passage slightly differently. But it, and I want to also acknowledge that several wonderful men of God, uh, you know, whom you greatly love and respect would have interpreted it as differently. So I greatly respect that I take off my cap to that, that view, no problem. Now we are not going to lose our salvation depending on how we interpret Revelation 11. But I, my purpose on reading Revelation 11 is to encourage this church so that this church will continue to be a powerful witness for Jesus Christ. And verse 1 says, verse 1 says, then I was given a, given a measuring stick and I was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar and count the number of worshippers. A voice perhaps from God, a voice perhaps the voice of Jesus says, you measure the temple. And this morning I believe Jesus is here. He wants to measure this church. And a measure of this church, we will quickly find out, is about how great or uh, how good the quality of the witnesses that are there in that church. The measure of a church largely depends on the quality of witnesses that are nourished and nurtured and sent out by that church. And that's what we will quickly discover. Now, uh, and, and I want to quickly, uh, quick, quickly move forward. I'm not going to read all the verses. I'm not going to interpret all the verses. But I'm going to talk about, you know, a few qualities, these witnesses that went out from this church that John measured. And I want you to look at your life and see if you have those qualities. Look at your life and see that you have those qualities. First of all, these two witnesses that Revelation never talks about were bad witnesses. Bad witnesses. Verse 3 says, but do not, uh, verse 3, it says, I will grant authority to my two witnesses. Underline the word there, two witnesses. They are bad. Now, I believe we don't learn anything dramatically new in the book of Revelation. Revelation is only emphasizing what we learned in the first 65 books of the Bible. So those two witnesses, I believe, is the witness of the church of Jesus Christ. And why do I say that? In Luke chapter 10, verse 1, the message version says, when Jesus, you know, Jesus, when he, uh, Jesus talks about sending 72 people, and how did he send them? Two by two. So, 
in a, in a pictorial way, John is seeing the church with Jesus will applaud. And in that church, the, they, 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 they have a system of witnessing which is a paid system of witnessing. I want to encourage you. No, no matter how busy your schedule is, no matter how crazy your work timing is, I want to encourage you to make your way to the local church. Make your way to Capstone. Because here you will find a pair with whom you will witness for Jesus Christ. You can't do it alone. Jesus sent 72 people, but he sent them in 36 pairs. To study the local ass, you know, Paul went with Silas. Paul and, you know, every ministry pair of the local acts had a, had a pair. They did ministry in groups. And that's why you need to come here. And uh, you need to find a friend. You need to fellowship. And uh, that's why Billy Graham said, Christians are like charcoals. Together they glow. Apart, they die out. Together they glow apart, they out, they die out. So when you come here, when you hear the warmth of God's word being preached to you, and you get ideas for witnessing, and when you have another friend who's also been kindled by the same word of God, with whom you find a partner for ministry. You know that's why in the wisdom of Southern Asia Bible College, the administrators, you know, none of us had single rooms in SABC. So they could be with Pastor Chaitanya one, one year and they could be with two other people in the three years that they were in. Because they know, they know being lonely. You run into a lot of problems. Just think of the life of David, you understand that. But I'm not going to go into David again. So here is, I don't want to preach for the life of David. So here is a paid witness. A paid witness. Secondly, here is a prophetic witness. The word of God says in verse 11, uh, verse 3 of Revelation 11, I will empower my witnesses and they will prophesy for 1,260 days. Now, they will prophesy the word of God says. See the previous chapter. You know, we need to read the Bible in the context. See the previous chapter. What is the previous chapter? Revelation 10. See the last portion of Revelation 10. Revelation 10 is talking about a man who is eating the scroll of God. A man who is biting the scroll of God and eating it. That scroll is the word of God. And after eating the scroll of God, that man, if you see in, in, in Revelation 10 verse 11, Revelation 10 verse 11, just the previous verse, just the last verse I, I know, before Revelation 11, 1 starts. And I was told you must again prophesy about many peoples, nations and languages and things. What is the lesson here? When you devour the Bible, when you devour the Bible, when you start reading the Bible, when you when you when you get immersed in the Bible, when you live in the Bible, when you eat the Bible, in Song of Psalms, uh, the Bible, uh, the, uh, there's a verse which says uh, the, the the girl tells the boy, boy, you know, I'm just uh, I'm just making it very uh, very direct, very simple. The girl gives an invitation to the boy, come and eat me. Song of Psalms, you know what I'm, you know what's happening. So, when the word of God in Revelation 10 talks about eating God's word, it's talking about an, a, an intimate time with God's word. Because this book is God's book. And when you open the pages and read, God is speaking to you. The maker of all the earth is speaking to you. This is his love letter to you. And in this, in this is a mirror. You know, when you read the mirror of God's word, you see your blunders. Just like your wife sees your biggest blunders next to God, when you open this mirror and look at this mirror long enough, you see the big blunders in your life. And you want to change yourself. And, and that message transforms your life. And when you're eating that message, words of prophecy comes out. So what you share over a coffee table, you know, in your in your in your company, in your corporate company, becomes prophetic. When you share what you read in the morning devotion over a coffee table, or over coffee with your colleague, what you share based on what you read in the morning devotion becomes prophetic to that person who's listening to you. I'm inviting you to be a prophetic witness who proclaims God's word led by the Spirit. The Spirit of God knows everything. You don't know anything. But the Spirit of God knows everything. You read God's word and He puts it in your heart. 
And when you start sharing it with needy people, what you share, my brother, what you share, my sister, becomes prophetic to that person. Thirdly, this is a period witness. Period witness. The Bible says in Revelation 11:3, they were supposed to witness for 1,260 days, or actually 42 months. 42 is six into seven months. Now, yeah, I, I have spent a lot of time thinking about it. I know Revelation is full of word pictures and number pictures. So six and seven means six is man's number, seven is God's number. Six is symbolic of the incomplete, seven is symbolic of the complete. So six and seven. I believe the, this uh, 42 months or 1260 days is, is symbolic of the time between the first coming of Jesus Christ and the second coming of Jesus Christ. And the theologians will call it the already but not yet time. Already seven, not yet six. Which means Jesus said, you know, Jesus said, the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom is already there. And then he said, then he talked about the second coming when the kingdom of God will come down. Not yet. I have I don't have the time to preach a big sermon on already not yet. No, that's a good struggle, you know. We we are already holy, yes. Positional sanctification. But we are being made holy. Not yet. That means we need to fight sin daily. You know, there are several dimensions of already not yet in the Bible. Which means we are we are we are a certain period in biblical history between the first coming or the second coming of Jesus Christ. We need to be a, we need to be witnesses. And when we witness, there will be struggle on coming to that, there will be temptation, there will be persecution, but we need to keep going, keep going, keep going. We have that period of already not yet 42 months of witness. But you know what? Some of us, the way we live, you know, when we walked into this beautiful, magnificent, high tech city, we just growing by the day, growing by the month, is transforming itself to becoming a New York City or a London. Slowly but surely, when we look at it, we live as if we are going to be, live as if we are going to live in this world forever. Not remembering we will only be here for only 42 months, scripturally speaking. That's why sometimes we have no place for God in our lives. You know, that's why we forget 1 Peter 2 11 says, we are pilgrims who are abstain, who are abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. We are pilgrims. And that's why we must sing with gibberings time and again. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. This is not our hometown. We are just temporarily existing here. We are called by God to be a witness for 42 months. This is the already, but not yet period. We can't, we, you know, we can't get too much entangled in the world and the lust. We can't, we can't get too much entangled in the world. You know, we are not boat, and the world is the sea. People are sinking in that world. We must pull out those people who are sinking and bring them into the boat. We must not allow the, the world to come inside the boat, otherwise the boat will sink. Fourth, persecuted witnesses. Revelation 11 talks about persecuted witnesses. You know, the Bible says in Revelation 11, 3, these witnesses were clothed in sackcloth. Sackcloth, you know, the Bible says when David, when Joseph died, when the sons brought his bloody clothes, this was a drama, but Joseph's clothes were made bloody by his brothers who were envious of him. But the Bible says in Genesis 37, 34, Joseph tore his garments and put on sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son for many days. So sackcloth in the Bible times is a sign of mourning. You are a witness, but you are a witness who mourns. Now, yesterday the news was about how Barack Obama broke down the normally cool on the outside, Barack Obama broke down and was thanking his volunteers for standing with him. Uh, and he recognized, he, he, he saw himself in those volunteers. Because 25 years before this time, he was like those volunteers, you know, busy helping all these great political giants of the United States. And uh, he said, you guys are so better than me. And he started weeping, he started weeping. I remember a time when I was a student of Alabama Agriculture Institute. You know, God was trying to deal with me. 
You know, I am a Sub-Indian boy from Tamil Nadu, 2,000 kilometers away from home, in North India, Allahabad, doing agriculture engineering. God was placing in my heart a burden for ministry, burden for the Google generation, the present day youth. I remember a time when I went with one of my friends and we were praying in the, in, you know, in, in the, in the mango groves of Allahabad and Kutch Institute. And when we prayed, the tears started welling down my cheek. I'm not a very emotional person. But I thank God for those experiences. When I pray with my wife, you know, if she weeps every second day of our prayer, I pray, Lord, help me to weep at least once in a month. I want to get that passion. I want to mourn for the lost. Sister Jan prayed a passionate prayer, you know, just a few minutes ago. That Lord, save High Tech City. I like that. That's what we must do. We must pray for the lost. When was the last time you cried? And and what and what was the reason which made you cry? Was it because you are praying for your friend in your corporate company, your friend who who is going down the wrong road, who has said goodbye to God, and is going on the broad road to destruction? Have you have tears well in your eyes when you pray for that precious friend? Morning witness. Morning witness. And then the Bible talks about in this chapter a prince witness. A prince witness. The Bible talks about, you know, in verse 4 of Revelation 11 4, the Bible says there are two olive trees. The prophets saw two olive trees. Who are the olive trees? Who are the olive trees? The two prophets are the two olive trees. Verse 4. Are you following me? The two prophets are the two olive trees. And you look at Judges 9.8. You know, uh, the, Bible, the Bible uses the book of Judges, especially chapter 9, there's a story there, where trees are likened to leaders. So these two witnesses are actually leaders. Now that reminds me of something. You know, when we have conversations with our friends who do not know Jesus Christ, we must take the lead. For example, they are busy questioning the uniqueness of Christ. They're saying all religions are basically the same. You now Buddha is the same, Rama is the same, Allah is the same, Jesus is the same. They are driving you, driving the conversation to one direction. That's when you must be a leader. That's when you must use your reading of apologetics. That's when you must, you know, you must bring reason to the table and say that's not possible. That's not possible. You can either call Jesus a liar, a lunatic, or Lord, but he said he's the only way. So he didn't give you the option of answering him as one of the many gods. Be the leader. Be the leader. Be the prince. Be the prince. There are 700 predictions in the Bible. Over 600 of those have been predicted. There's not even a single event which is predicted in the Bible that has ever gone wrong. And this book is worth listening to because it's never gone wrong in its predictions. Scientific predictions are only 25% accurate. You know, we need to, we need to take the lead when it comes to conversations. Sixthly, you know, Revelation 11 talks about you know, uh, in 11, when you, when you start scrolling down, you see how fire comes from the mouth of these witnesses and devours their enemies. And how rain will not fall after they prophesy. It's talking about supernatural works and wonders. As witnesses, I want to tell you something. We need to, you know, we need to have the element of the supernatural in our witnessing. Because we, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We, we, we are living in the period of Acts chapter 29. That's why when there was a time, you know, several years ago, four, four, five years ago, almost five years ago, you know, when my wife came crying out of the, of the scan set, the saying, the doctors are telling the baby inside my stomach is dead. There's no life in that baby. The baby inside my stomach is dead. We knelt down and we prayed to the Lord Jesus and said, Lord, you can do a miracle. Not according to our will, but your will, but you're a miracle working God. Intervene. 
and the Lord intervened and he gave life back to the baby which was inside her white stomach and that baby is alive and tomorrow God willing she will celebrate our fifth birthday my daughter so I have got several stories like this so these are stories I must talk about and so when my friend says I have a need I have a sickness I have a dead end I have a son of Jesus who can work miracles in his will according to his will power witnesses Seventh, the Bible, this Revelation 11 talks about Peter's witnesses as well. You know, the Bible says, you know, the beast would come and kill them. You read the whole chapter, and the dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city. The beast will come and kill them. Jesus said in Luke 23, 31, if people do this to the green tree, that's me, what will happen to you, bright tree? If I lived a sinless life on this earth, and they laughed at me, lampooned me, stripped me naked, and set me on a on a on a hung me and on a on a cross and whipped me and did all these things to me. What will they do to you, my follower? Same thing. You're really my follower. Because they'll laugh at you. They'll call you the modern male, a modern Mother Teresa, because you're not having sex outside of marriage. Right? Like X, Y, Z in your corporate co company. Like X, Y, Z in your call center. They will call you uncomplimentary names. But I want you to get the piercing. You know what? When you get the piercing on your body because you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you're a witness of Jesus Christ, you get a joy unspeakable, full of glory, which the world cannot give you, which money cannot buy, which the devil cannot take away. That's the joy he will give you. You're a pierced witness. You're a pierced witness. And then, the word of God also says, they are planet witness because the people from the whole world saw them. People from, they were dead and their bodies were lying and the whole world saw it. You know what? No. You know what? You might die, you might die for being a witness of Jesus Christ, but your story will travel. You know, Ragland, came with the gospel to the southern part of Tamil Nadu where my forefathers lived and he rode on a horseback and gave the gospel to my forefathers. Ragland is dead but he still inspires me. No, you might, you will die but still speak. And not only that, this passage also make, reminds me that the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed to the whole world as a testimony to all the nations and then the end will come. Which means, uh, as God is, God, I thank God He's training you in this local church. But one day, now this is a prophecy. Now I'm not a prophet, not a son of a prophet, but I prophesy. This is a prophecy. God will open doors for you. You who have been trained in this church to go to that faraway land. No, you know, you know, and uh, that place where there are no churches that much, that place where the Google generation is still going to Gehenna, and you, fired by the messages that have preached this church, uh, trained by the wonderful pastor couple in this church, getting all the training here, you will go out and reach the lost, to the nations, to the ends of the earth. You will do that. And you will make some wise choices. You will make some wise choices because you will go to the place where there is a need. You know, for example, if there's an opportunity from Greater Washington and Greater Noida, you might prefer to go to Greater Noida because in North India, very few people know about Jesus Christ. And if there's an opportunity where you, you know, where for you to, you know, go to Georgia in the United States and Georgia, South of Russia, you might prefer to go to Georgia, South of Russia because just the, the communist walls are lifted up and all these Europeans, uh, you know, all these Russians are eager to hear the gospel. I'm just throwing ideas. When you get a proposal to marry in the, and settle down the United States, and there's another proposal for the Northern States, you, because you're a planet witness, and you go to the parts of the planet without Jesus Christ, and you are, have a burden, you might prefer to go there. As the Lord leads you. As the Lord leads you. And I want to just mention one more thing, and I want to close. But also you are joining witnesses. The Bible says, Three hundred days, these guys were up. The bodies were open, but suddenly the 
breath of life from God came onto them. They stood up on their feet. Fear fell upon those people. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up into heaven in the cloud. And the enemies watched them. I believe this is just a different version of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. Just a different version of 1 Thessalonians 4, 4, 16 and 17. The Lord Himself will descend down from heaven with a loud shout, with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will live first. And after that, we who are still alive are left and will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. No, we have, there's a there, there's a time, there's a day. We don't know when, but Jesus is coming back. He is coming back. Why are you why are we coming to church? To get ready for this coming. To get ready for this coming. And uh, he's gonna come back. And we must be ready to go. We must be ready to go. We must be ready to go. I want you to close your eyes. All eyes closed and all heads down. I just saw a few ideas from Revelation chapter 11. I want you to go back and read it and God will speak to you. Jesus is here in this church. He wants to measure this church. And the measure of a church is how many martyrs it will produce. People will be committed. People will say, I'm ready to even shed blood for Jesus Christ, but I will be a witness to my life, to my life. And if this church will produce, will create, people, you know, being a martyr is God, it's in God's hands, it's not in your hands. But people with the mind of being a martyr. I will be a witness for Jesus Christ. No matter what comes, no matter what happens, even if I lose my life, and they parade my dead body to the world, I don't care. I will be a witness for Jesus. Till he comes again, or till I die. No. When Jesus comes into the church, that's the kind of people he's looking for. And I know, I know, I know, I know. This church is full of those young people, full of those families. But I want you to make a commitment today that you will be that kind of person. No compulsion here. But if you want to be that kind of that kind of witness, a witness who says anything for the Lord Jesus, even if I have to lose my life, it's fine. When I have life, that life will reflect Jesus. When I die. I would have died for Jesus. That kind of commitment. Costly commitment. Costly commitment. I want you to make a commitment. If you want to be that kind of person, that kind of witness, I just want you to put your hand over your heart and lift your hand. One hand over your heart and lift your hand. One hand over your heart and lift your hand. Yes. Costly commitment. He's here to measure this church. And the measure of this church is how many Mata ready witnesses are there. How many Mata ready witnesses are there? Yes. Several hands are going up. I want you to do the second thing. I want you to get up on your seats and come right, right in the front. In a few minutes of prayer. Come on, come on. You raise 